In December 2005, I was sitting in my office at Washington University and I received an email with the subject line, death. And the email read, death has come upon Sam Mukama. He was buried last week. Agnes, his mother, is deeply grieving. Two weeks later, after my courses had ended, and as I and the rest of you in the audience were out doing our mindless acts of consumerism to get ready for the holiday, I received another email from Uganda. And I thought, oh no. And I opened it. And it said, Grace passed and we are burying her next week. And this was Agnes's last born her much beloved grace. My heart dropped and a numbness came over me. And I thought, how could a mother suffer the death of her firstborn and her lastborn in one month's time? I came to know Agnes, who is a widow, when I was doing research for my PhD dissertation at, at Yale University. I had stayed with her family in the mid-90s. She had been a widow at the time for about two years. People said that her husband died of leprosy, but I assumed it was HIV. I got to know the family, and over the last 20 years, I have been observing as the children have gone through different changes. I am a medical anthropologist, and this is how we come to know the information that we know. Every discipline is defined by its methodology and by its body of evidence that it collects. Who's taken an anthropology class? So as you know, as an anthropologist, our methodology is we go and we live someplace for a long time. We immerse ourselves in the life waves of people. We go to the market, we go to the pub, we go back to the market and back to the pub. We hang out at people's homes. We listen to gossip. It's called participant observation. And for two and a half years for my dissertation research, I've done this. In subsequent visits, I have gone back to Uganda for six months, three months, four months at a time. In addition to that, we collect narratives. Our whole purpose is to collect the way people understand the structures around them. And in my case, I use anthropology to understand how do people who are living in a context of inequality, marginalization, and at the bottom of the global hierarchy of economic stratification, how do they make sense of the world around them? How do they still find joy? How do they love? And that's what I would like to introduce you to today. I welcome you into the lives of the people of Uganda who I have come to know, love, and respect over the last 20 years. But as an academic, I always tell my students, academic writing is not a mystery novel. I should not wait until the last paragraph of your paper to find out what you're arguing. So hence, I'm going to start my talk with my conclusion. After 20 years of doing research and 25 years of doing work in East Africa, my main conclusion is that poverty and inequality is a result not of capitalism broken, but of capitalism working quite well. Every single person I have met in Uganda over the last two decades knows somebody, has cared for somebody, and has been there when somebody they know, love, and respect has died of HIV. This is the reality of HIV in Africa. But there's another side. This is a side that I saw daily. Just like you and me, just like everybody else, people had life projects that involved seeking love, that involved having children, that involved reproducing for the next generation and building a future and a legacy. And this is the side of Africa that I want to bring to you today, the compassionate side. Because as an anthropologist, I believe we have something to learn not only about people's suffering, but about the way people still explore their life projects 
in the nature and in the context of suffering. And even as Africa goes through the change that the rest of the world does, amidst the anti-homosexuality debates that the U.S. is exporting elsewhere, people are seeking love, the type of love that they would like. As an anthropologist, the dilemma of this world is how do you access intimacy in a place where it's supposed to be so private, where young people are not supposed to publicly date, where they're not supposed to talk about it, because adults are afraid of pregnancy, of HIV, of breaching traditional norms. And that's where I stumbled upon love letters. Elders, particularly older women postmenopausals, were very free to talk about their coming of age stories, their first romantic love, their first boyfriend, or men, their first girlfriend. When it came to adults, they also expressed it, but young people giggled. Young people were shy. They were afraid that I would tell their parents that they were seeking love. So I stumbled upon love letters, 300 of them to be precise, that young people were willing to give me because they wanted the world to know what was in their hearts and what they desired for their future. And so if you would, I would like to share some of these with you. But first, what these letters tell us. These letters to me are not only a window into romance, but they're a window into how young people take the different messages coming at them from HIV. How they categorize notions of risk and incorporate them into their sex lives. How they navigate risk and say, despite risk, I still want to get married. I still want to have children. Their love letters are also containing what they see as globalized imagery of romance, from Harlequin romance novels to soft sex magazine covers to beer ad advertisements that are selling not only beer but modern romance to South African movies. All of these images, both risk and pleasure, are what young people are confronting, and the love letters give us insight into how they incorporate these into their lives. For example, I just want to put out what I call periphery aspects of love letters. When I do a textual analysis, it's not just about the content of the letter, but it's how people package it. So if you look to the top right, you see the return address, a site of creativity. As this guy writes, return address, love is the source of life. Their openings were always an opportunity to entice their recipient, and he says, the jumbulication is toward beyond human degree, rather for to write to you this simple commentient piece of letter. Because who would not, who would resist a man who was so eloquent? <laughs> then at the bottom left, many of the boys' love letters were sealed with please keep it secret. And he says, please reply, madam. Let them be in secret, please. Because boys knew if they got caught, they would be in trouble. And I loved how creative they got with some of their expressions. So on the bottom right, remember that love without sex is the same as tea without sugar. <laughs> so despite the horrors of HIV, young people were doing what young people do around the world, flexing their romantic abilities. Now this guy I like, and I think he should take an anthropology class. And he writes, before I symbolize my symbolized symbology symbologically, <laughs> I would like to write multiplying love between me and you. My love is as lasting as a gravity stone. I love you because you are beautiful, charming, and my best friend. I will always love you until the sea dries. Your shining face attracts and affects my feelings and makes me even mix up my chemicals wrongly. <laughs> anyway, I would like to hinder or stop here because I have much in mind than in written. Otherwise, I may end up in tears. See? It worked. I appreciated the girls' love letters. Whereas around the world, we say romance is one time in a man's life where he can reverse the gender hierarchy and perform like a peacock, strutting, dancing, saying to the woman how I love you. For girls, it's a time to protect their respectability 
and many of the girls do. So instead of thinking girls in Africa as vulnerable, as they indeed are, I like to look at their letters for signs of their own resistance to being roped into the hierarchy of gender categories that makes them vulnerable. They pull upon the Bible, they pull upon local proverbs, and they pull upon abstinence messages. And this girl says, Dear William, sorry for having let you down because you were showing me disloyalness. Remember I told you that if I find you with another girl, that will be the end of our love? On my side, I was trying to show you loyalness to you as my guy by not loving other boys on the outside. Remember that the Bible says in Hebrew 13 verse 4, let marriage be honorable among all and the marriage bed be without defilement, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. <laughs> and in Peter 3, verse 7, huh, try to read it. <laughs> and now I fear you because you can spoil me for nothing. You have the aim of saying that other girls cry for you. Continue with those ones who cry for you. <laughs> but unfortunately, the trappings of modernity and capitalism lead all of us to do things we do not imagine ourselves doing. And in a context where girls do not have access to economic opportunities, and their parents who are cash-strapped find a better return for sending their sons to school rather than their girls, some of the girls have to resort to other ways to meet the trappings of modernity that are around them. But boys also capitalize on this. They both see notions of sugar daddies that are plastered throughout Africa, warning young girls, even though you want to be rich, avoid the sugar daddies. So boys are clever. This boy says, but although my pocket is light, I am better than those rich men around because they are diseased, HIV. But this is, by the way, any time you will get money in your life. I don't see why you need to hurry like that. The love letters have taught me a lot, and I thought I knew a lot. They've taught me that the paradigm that we use for behavior change around the world might be a little bit faulty. Yes, whenever I teach on HIV, my students always say, oh, we need to educate people about HIV. We need to tell them about condoms, delaying sex, abstaining from sex. Our public health model tells us that health knowledge is equal to behavior change. But we know donuts are bad for us. We know we should exercise every day. We know we should use a condom. And then we think, but we're married. But we like donuts. So what I'm arguing is that desire might be a stronger pull than rational thought. And in fact, desire is rational thought. The second most way that HIV is transmitted, besides mother-to-child transmission, as Grace got it at the beginning of my talk, is injecting drug users. It's not about that they don't know risk. It's about they want to build a community. For example, I always say it's not how do we get people to use condoms or use clean needles or not eat donuts or go jogging every day, but it's about why do people engage in behaviors that put them at risk? Why do people not use condoms? Why do people share needles? And a lot of times it's for compassion, for a connection, and that's the human pull that anthropologists are interested in. The second finding is economic desires. We live in a globalized world. People desire material things. People think romance and love is the site of expression. People want their children to have a better life than they did. So sometimes we hear survival sex is what people in the global south at risk. But I would also like to say sometimes it's just the flat out desire to have a good life. It's the quest for desires that sometimes is what's people, putting people at risk. For example, 
Young people are very aware. These were pictures that young people drew. I asked them to draw about romance and uh, establishing a relationship in the past versus today. And they gave a moral critique. They said in the past, it was arranged marriage, not enforced marriage. But their suitor would meet a father around a drinking hole, and they would get to know each other, and they would develop a relationship that way. Families were involved. You could decide if the person you were with met a certain criteria. And they said, today in this individualized world, we look for love ourselves, we promise romance, we promise material things. And so to them, to have romance in a time where it's supposed to be material but they can't afford it, it leads to a decline in their mind of morality. So even though in the West, we might look at the global South and say, oh my goodness, what's going on? The internal moral critique is even greater. I started with this slide and I want to add a bottom one. Poverty is actually bad for the romantic love that we are all envisioning, unfortunately. That's what I've learned. But despite this, I have seen many cases where human affection remains strong and the human experience can teach us all a lot about life, love, compassion, and how people around the world in situations of economic precarity make sense, build a family, and have love in times of desperation. And as an anthropologist, I've learned if we open up our ears to listen to those voices, we can learn a hell of a lot about ourselves and about those we're interested in. Thank you very much.